think people are getting in. All right, let's get back to this then. So um, reconvening now at 731. Um, before we begin, I'm going to read the second part of our announcement of public notice uh, since we're on Zoom right now. Um, so during this meeting, we ask that all members of the public mute themselves unless they are speaking during a public comment period. If we needed, we may mute up you ourselves. You may leave your video on or off of your option. If we experience bandwidth issues and believe that limiting video could help, we may do so. We will have at least two public comment periods. If at that time you wish to speak, please raise your blue virtual hand in Zoom and wait for me to call on you. If you cannot raise your virtual hand or if I miss your virtual hand, please turn on your video camera and raise your actual hand. New Jersey law requires us to inform you that all commenters must behave appropriately. In Highland Park, this means no screaming, obscenities, or inappropriate video displays. In the event of a speaker's inappropriate behavior, they will be muted and we will come back to them at a later time. If the speaker is the final commenter at the final last final comment period, we will invite them to return at our next meeting. Um, we are going to the um, model of having two public comment periods. One, which is um, so that the public doesn't have to stay up uh, till all hours of the evening, will be right after the superintendent's report or virtually after the superintendent's report before the committee board reports. And the second one will be after the, after the board reviews our different uh, 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 agenda sections. So, um, so uh, Linda, could we have the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Wait one second. Oh, oh Scott, excuse Dr. me. Well, Dr. Taylor will provide it for us. Yes, indeed. OK. I pledge allegiance to the flag but of the United States, the United of, America States of America and to the Republic, and to the Republic for, which it, for stands, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice, and for justice for all. Thank, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Linda. Um, so we had, we had three communications to the board uh, one from uh, Jen Voorhees on mask enforcement, one from Ethan Schoolman on returning students to the classroom, and one from Rob Scott about the community-wide vaccine event. This was a, an event held uh, last night by the Highland Park Vax Help Group uh, talking about uh, vaccinations for um, people, un uh, pe all people, but pe also people under 18 years old, the 16 and 17 year olds, which I'm gonna say a few words on uh, after uh, Dr. Taylor. Um, is finished with his uh, uh, remarks. So um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. So uh, I'd like to move those both, the virtual public, well, I'll move the first one. Um, so I'll move to approve the virtual public workshop meeting on March 15th. Do I have a second? No, no, excuse me, point of order. Yes. This is a workshop meeting. We are not voting. Oh, we're not going to vote oh, on these. Sorry. Right, I forgot too. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, we are voting on the negotiations, though. Yes. Yes. That is, okay. That is sorry, that confused me. Um, okay, so we have them on the agenda. We'll vote on those next time. That's a obviously a voting meeting, um, and we will have our student representative report. And I see Polly. So yep. Polly, uh, mute yourself hi. and take over. Yeah. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, so starting with the high school, congrats to the HP Monk team for winning the best um, big delegation at the Rutgers Model, U Model Congress Conference last week. Um, 18 of our team members won individual awards ranging from best position paper to most improved to uh, best delegate. Um, our DECA chapter will be competing virtually this week at the annual International Career Development Conference um, so we wish them luck. And the girls volleyball team advanced to group one South state finals, um, which is really exciting. Uh, Ms. Sadiq from the middle school made a spring break poetry prompt challenge for his students. Um, so submission should be coming in um, and that's super exciting. The middle school combined their cohort, cohorts um, on April 19th. Um, so there are about 80 students now in the building 
um, on April 14th, there was a live virtual interactive environmental assembly program, um, which included the Illusion Makers virtual environmental program, um, which was a super exciting experience. And the students got to participate in a TV style game show um, to learn more about the environment um, and what we can do to help it. Um, no updates from Bartle. And then at Irving, they look forward to celebrating Earth Day this Thursday. Um, they'll be painting birdhouses, planting flowers, giving tours of the garden, um, hearing a read aloud and uh, much more. And then next week at Irving, um, they're hosting their first ever Neurodiversity Spirit Week, which is really exciting. Um, and they're going to culminate the week with bubbles and music out on the playground. And that wraps up the student report. Holly, thank you very much. Uh, any uh, board members with any questions or comments? <clears throat> okay. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Taylor to give the superintendent's report looking ahead to the summer and the next school year starting in September. Thanks, Mark. Before I get to that, I, I do want to um, uh, follow up a concern of which I was made aware last week regarding the middle school math program. And so I invited Dr. Nicosia, you can wave Dr. Nicosia, our director of curriculum, whose main specialty is STEM mathematics uh, included. So before I have um, Dr. Nicosia say a few words about the math program, let me just set the stage and uh, point out to some board members and members of the com uh, community who are here, what that concern was. Um, we, uh, several years ago began the process of wanting to merge uh, two of the three levels of our math, I should just say the two levels of our math six program. Um, previously, we ran a math uh, six in what we call six A, six advanced uh, level of sixth grade math. Uh, it has been our intent to combine those classes and create what we're going to call math six plus. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nikosia has been working very closely with the stakeholder group that's included uh, scholars from Rutgers, uh, a few parents, uh, teachers, and at least one member of the board, me, uh, in conversations that led to a listening session uh, that we had for the community just before the pandemic, um, so about a year and a half ago. It was our hope that. Um, we would be able to launch the program uh, uh, this year and uh, the next year. And unfortunately, because the pandemic decided to intrude on all of our business and personal lives, we decided to uh, put things off for a year. So I do want to uh, make sure that the board and those members of the community who are a little out of the loop about this topic are aware that last May 29th, May 29th, 2020, uh, Ms. Brady sent out this letter in which we, through which we pointed out to everybody that because of the pandemic, we were going to put the six plus plans off. However, we were going to um, place all students in a math six program. Uh, and Ms. Brady points out that she recognizes, we recognize that some students would need more support and enrichment. So um, here we are. And uh, I think a year and a half uh, away from our plans, um, many in the community have forgotten what we were up to. Uh, and that's perfectly um, reasonable because of all the things that have been going on the year, last year and a half. So we're going to remind everybody about our mission. The parallel concern uh, was that um, that was brought to my attention last week is that um, we were not initially going to offer a seventh grade algebra pre-algebra algebra program, uh, and and our our initial thinking was uh, we were concerned about the kids not um, having the proper instruction they need this year pandemic year going into next year we wanted to slow things down that being said i met with uh, miss brady um miss sukow the assistant principal of the middle school and dr nikosia uh, last week and Nico dr nikosia is now going to share some of what we ended up talking about 
and uh, and hopefully this does address uh, people's concerns. So Dr. Nikosia, you have sh screen sharing rights. Okay, good evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Let me just get myself set up here. One second. Okay, so thanks again for um, having me on. It's good to see everybody tonight. I'm excited to talk about um, some of the updates about our Math 6 programming and to address some of the concerns that um, the community has. So first and foremost, um, to Dr. Taylor's point, the um, teachers and I- Dr. Nikosha, I, I have to remind everybody who might be here present, please make yourself muted. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. You're good. Um, that we, we met a bunch of the, the teachers, myself, Ms. Brady, uh, met to um, talk about math placement for next year. And typically we do offer three options for our sixth graders going into seventh grade, which is typically algebra, pre-algebra and um, math seven. Algebra being a two grade level jump in mathematics, pre-algebra being a one grade level jump and math seven being the, the next grade level um, advancement uh, for math. Due to a lot of the concerns that uh, Dr. Taylor brought up, um, we explored, you know, not offering, you know, um, algebra uh, for our students next year for, for a myriad of reasons. Um, and, and I'll get into those in my presentation. Uh, but we were putting in um, math seven and pre algebra. So just to, uh, like Dr. Taylor said, sort of uh, reorient us to our middle school math redesign that we initiated a couple of years ago. Um, we started in 2018 with a committee of stakeholders that began the work to detrack our sixth grade math program. Because as we know from the research that uh, detract math classes provides more rigorous curricula for all students and it helps to close our significant math achievement gap that we have at the middle school. So the idea was we were moving away from Math 6 and Math 6A. And instead of merging the two courses, we were really offering a Math 6 plus course, which was more options for all students. So it was going to be a, a more rigorous curriculum for all students, even our Math 6A students, by providing complex tasks, um, rich performance task assessments, and we'd still cover all the sixth grade standards and some of the major standards from seventh grade. So offering options that didn't exactly exist in our current 6A curriculum and, and putting in a, a new uh, curricula that, that offers a, a lot more opportunities for all students. In addition, I wanted to address some of the professional development that, happened, that has happened and will continue to happen for this type of programming. This past year, we brought in a math, um, two types of math coaches um, for support for the teachers. One was Mary Oates from um, Conquer Math to meet with the sixth grade teachers to work on best practices uh, and scope and sequence, essentially trying to, to fit in the curriculum within the, the time span and the schedule that we had this year. We thought that was very, very important to do. In addition, we brought in Dennis Sheeran, who's a math expert uh, that worked with the teachers in the, in the spring of last year and in the beginning of this year on differentiated instruction. Uh, moving forward in the look ahead to next year, we'll continue work with our best practice uh, strategies and scope and sequence with Mary Oates, our math consultants, and we'll look to bring in complex task training. We were not able to do that this year. Uh, that type of work really works well uh, with with face to face type of professional development, and it was just really hard to, to schedule that. Our complex training expert is Dr. Dan Batty uh, from Rutgers University Graduate School of Education, and and trying to make it work remotely just seemed to be very complicated. So we figured we would offer that in person um, next year for the teachers. So um, a in the spring of 2020. Um, like Dr. Taylor said, that we sent home a letter postponing that Math 6 Plus course due to the circumstances that caused, you know, the disruption to the plans, the pandemic, um, the emergency school closure in the spring. The committee met and overwhelmingly agreed that it was best to postpone it a year. 
um, to allow our incoming sixth graders an opportunity to you know, fill in any gaps they had from the closure with their fifth grade standards um, and make sure that we really um, address the, the sixth grade standards to a high, the highest level of proficiency um, that we could. So all students were placed in our math six course and we did focus a lot on enrichment and support. So I know, for example, our sixth grade students received some uh, problem-based learning tasks, performance tasks, such as creating food truck menus um, during their decimal unit and things like that. So they had some opportunities for enrichment, what we call uh, low floor, high ceiling tasks in which all students can find success with, with the tasks, with the math um, tasks that were presented and providing the necessary supports uh, to make sure that any student that had some of those gaps or issues from the spring that we address those as well. So um, some of the problems that we faced collectively as we talked through math placement for next year, for our current school year, and I know that I'm, everybody is already familiar with this, but just to remind you and reorient everybody that we offered three days of synchronous instruction. Um, we had some highly unpredictable changes to the schedule, uh, Wednesdays being one of those um, on again, off again uh, changes. We had some changes to our asynchronous instruction in terms of it being required, um, then not required and things like that. So all of those changes really resulted in um, struggles to get all of our students to the highest level of proficiency they could with meeting the sixth grade standards. So again, the um, excuse me, whoever, uh, okay. you know what, um, I got it. <laughs> I was going to mute you all and then go ahead. You're good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so again, there, we, we noticed that there were some struggles with getting our students to these high level proficiencies that we normally would have in the past with, with those unpredictable changes. And so, like I said, we met as a department and the sixth grade teachers just felt that the students collectively probably weren't strong enough to um, jump to grade levels to do a, a, to do algebra um, in seventh grade. So when we put out the letter, we put out the letter with the options of going to the next grade level, math seven standards, or sort of moving up one grade level to our pre-algebra standards with the caveat in the note that um, the note did indicate to contact me to discuss other mathematic um, you know, or, you know, arrangements if, if necessary. The other issue that we had in terms of the current school year is typically we offer, in the past, we always offer the Algebra Iowa Readiness Test. It's a paper-based test that really provides us a rich data point to determine students' algebra readiness. And that's a, that's a big factor for that, um, for placement into that class. We explored some options for some online algebra tests, but we collectively did not find one that would reliably give us the data we need and was valid enough to do um, while at home and not being proctored and, and things like that. So we felt that because of that, we just didn't have you know, the necessary data points to make informed decisions about algebra placement. Um, so that was sort of what um, led us to offering, um, you know, pre-algebra and algebra next year with, again, the, the move toward going back to our regular, hopefully, regularly scheduled programming of options the following year in the event that we're, you know, back to normal and running our more rigorous curriculum um, to provide opportunities for, for all students. So. But we do understand that that is causing some some concern with with some of our um, students and 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 families um, in the district, and and we wanted to address that that um, tonight. And so one of the things that we would consider is is still offering algebra next year. But I want to be very careful to make sure that we provide an equitable opportunity to that high level class. That's really something that's important to us and. You know, we can offer the algebra readiness assessment. And one of the things that Dr. Taylor, Ms. Brady and I can work on is how we offer this opportunity to take the readiness test for all of our students. So some of the things we might have to consider obviously is it's relatively easy to do for our in-person students, but we would have to probably consider sending 
staff members to homes to allow all of our students to, to take this test. So we're trying to consider options to make it equitable. Um, one of the, the concerns that I had was if, if parents just called me and said, I want my child to go into algebra, which is completely fine and we support that decision. My concern was that it was a barrier that if a parent didn't speak up, that their child wouldn't have access to that. So um, it, there is a, I, I want everybody to know that there's a, a delicate balance between um, providing those advancements in our math placement with doing what's you know best for, for students' um, uh, academic needs, but also their social and emotional learning needs, um, you know, throughout this this unprecedented time. Now, I hate saying that because I feel like it's being said a lot, but that's really our concern is, is trying to find that balance. So again, um, I'll let you know Dr. Taylor pick it up, um, but you know, trying to trying to find um, what will be right to ensure that all of our students have access to take the assessment and have an opportunity for algebra next year. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nikosha. Um, so so uh, we, I do allow questions from the board when I make a presentation. So um, it looks like Anne Gowan has a question. So Dr. Nikosha, stick around a few more minutes and uh, Absolutely. maybe you can help me field these questions. Absolutely. Anne? I well, first of all, thanks to both of you. Thanks, Dr. Nicosia, for that explanation. Um, I just want to, could you guys hear me? Is my, I'm having all kinds of audio visual. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, how confident I am in the new Math 6, uh, six for All. Can I call it Math 6 for All for now to make clear that I'm not talking about 6A or 6 Plus? Um, I think it sounds wonderful. And I know you have been working for years now to ensure this, the correct supports are in place so that students will get both math savvy kids who are excited about math will get to go a little farther and kids who find math to be more of a challenge uh, will get the support they need to cover you know sixth grade math um, i think what you may be hearing from some parents is concern that this letter back in may that we all received well not me i'm not i'm not a sixth grade parent uh fifth grade parent whatever um the letter said that you know it'll be math six next year and we're going to differentiate in math six so number one, we canceled Math 6A without a lot of talk about why, even though we were gonna you know, push the new math off till this coming year, this next year. And then we implied in the letter that we were gonna differentiate, meaning, so I, I think parents, many parents assumed that they were gonna have, the, their kids were gonna have the opportunity to go a little bit faster and get up to algebra. So I, I just, while I'm super confident about this program, I am a little disappointed that we weren't able to communicate that clearly to parents uh, back in May um, of this year. I think you okay. may be here, so. Uh, un understood. Thank you, uh, Anne. Uh, Monique has her hand up as well. Go ahead, Monique. Yeah, uh, I meant to put that down actually because Anne asked one of my questions. I just wanted some clarification on what the concerns uh, were that were expressed. Um, and I guess, again, thank you, Christina, for the presentation and uh, refreshing us all on where we are with things. Um, I, I guess my question is about the um, access to the assessment being kind of one level of equity. Um, but I'm just wondering if you're thinking ahead in terms of what the results of that assessment show, right? That pre-algebra assessment show um, in terms of the equitable distribution of um, you know, results in that assessment. So um, if you're not already thinking about that, you know, which I'm sure you probably are, um, but just to kind of tie that into um, the response or the, um, yeah, the response and what happens next after the assessment results are processed. Okay. Thank Do you. you want us to comment on that now, Monique, or are you suggesting that? You don't have to, I'm just, be very yeah. Mindful. Okay. Yeah, just to be mindful of that. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that um, in the coming months. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, so one of the things we talked about on the math committee meetings was uh, if, if we're going to have a very, very heterogeneous ability classes and, and do a lot of differentiation, it was important to get the uh, student to teacher ratio down. So what, what was the student to ratio and uh, to teacher ratio in those classes this year? I mean, was it lower in order? Because it, it seems like if the class, student to teacher, teacher ratio was what it was usually, then I can understand why not very much differentiation happened. 
Chris, I can respond to that question by tomorrow once I talk to Caitlin Brady and find out what that what those numbers are. Okay. Yep. So I'll I'll, I'll do that by email. Okay, Chris. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Anne, back to you. So, I mean, I guess I, a confusion that I know some parents had was why did we decide not to offer Math Six A this past school year? Was that because of a scheduling issue or? We didn't think we'd be able to do math 6a in the shortened instructional time yeah the the com the committee felt that um well on the committee let me just preface that on the committee we have some fifth grade math teachers mm -hmm. and i think because of the emergency school closure in march having lost oh. a couple of months of instruction there was some concern i reached out miss fisher for example a fifth grade teacher you know had concerns about not being able to provide normally they provide some more advanced options for the fifth graders in the spring, you know, getting them ready in the spring. And they just couldn't, they just could, those fifth grade teachers were, <laughs> yeah, I give the teachers a lot of credit if I don't oh, say yeah. it publicly, because, you know, especially in the spring when, when things hit the proverbial fan, it was very hard to, to, to provide the, the students the, the necessary means to, to find success. So we, as a committee felt that it was important just to provide everybody with sort of meet everyone where they were at in sixth grade and you know hope to get them to a, a better place that was the goal that totally makes sense thank you You're i think welcome. parents just got a little confused about what was of happening course. of yeah. course but thank you so much for explaining You're chris back to you yeah if, if i could just add one thing um I'm, I'm glad that the district is is trying to be careful about accelerating uh because it's so important not to accelerate until, unless people have really mastered the middle middle school math um, we, we see so many people at the college level who are failing out of their STEM course because they've gone too quickly through the middle school curriculum and haven't really mastered it, have been maybe encouraged to, to be in these accelerated programs uh, when they were really just struggling and should have. So, so, so yeah, for, the, for these students, you know, putting them into a, a more rigorous or accelerated framework could really be harming the chances of getting a STEM degree. I, I just wanted to add one other thing. This, this isn't only happening at at Highland Park. I mean, every everybody who's teaching math that I know has covered less material this year. And not only that, but but is really uh, it's harder to assess where people are, and you don't want to accelerate them without really having uh, confidence about what they know. And that's just been really hard this year. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions or comments, Dr. Dakosha, thank you. Uh, welcome. You can step out if you'd like. I'm going to transition to my next presentation, uh, which will have me focusing on the plans I committed uh, to sharing with the board and the community tonight for the summer and the fall. Uh, now, please be mindful that these plans are, they're solid plans. We're still working on details. Uh, we are in the, already in the process of hiring staff, recruiting and then hiring staff for the summer who will have inform us about the nuts and bolts of the program. So we want to make a, a, a collaborative process, planning process for such things as um, lesson planning uh, for these programs in the summer, uh, types of activities that will be facilitated, specific activities with the with the faculty who will be uh, supporting those those classes. But before I get to the summer and the fall, I do I did get a couple of emails from parents, guardians uh, over the past um, couple of days uh, about what the rest of this year looks. So I just want to make sure that um, everybody understands with the last two months of schools of school looming, uh, how things are going to play out. I'm committed to the four hour instructional day. Um, my primary reason for doing so is clear recognition that um, more than four hours spent in a virtual learning environment is um, is not good. It's uh, it's damaging to um, our many of our students' well being, their mental health, as well as their 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 physical well being. Um, it, it's uh, very hard for me to imagine kids sitting in front of screens for more than four hours. And the reality is that at this point, 70% of our student population is learning from home. 
Um, even if those numbers shifted a bit, the vast majority of kids are at home. So am I going to increase four hour a day? The other reason is actually more, uh, uh, has to do with more about with, with logistics. Increasing the four hour day would mean I would have to offer lunch, which throws a curveball in our safety and health protocols. Um, very few school districts in our neighborhood or have gone that route because it's been so difficult to maintain health and security. You know, one, uh, uh, health and safety. One of the um, things I'm proud of so far is that Highland Park has, for the time that we've been in session, despite a couple of speed bumps, been able to keep the um, uh, the the number of positive cases reported among the student body and the staff body at a relatively low uh, number, particularly compared to our peers. So I think what we're doing is 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 the right thing, and we're going to continue to do that thing for the rest uh, rest of the school year. We will continue through June to maintain three foot distances at Irving and Bartle. Uh, both Ms. McNally and Ms. Knapp have been working with parents and guardians who were, uh, have their kids on the wait list to switch back into uh, uh, the school buildings. Um, at any time we think we can you know, open up a little more room, a little more space, we will do so and we'll continue to try to take students in. Right now, I believe we've um, we've exhausted what we can from the wait list. There are still some people waiting. I know at Bartle uh, to see if we can bring their uh, their children into the school building. At the upper grades, we are currently and for the unforeseen future um, going to maintain six foot distances in our classes. As you know, the only way that we can uh, shift to a three foot distance model is if the local community spread uh, drops precipitously. And right now it hasn't. Although today I understand we didn't have any cases. That's a good sign. And if the trend continues, I have no problem um, directing the principals to um, remeasure our classrooms, prepare for bringing more students in, assuming we can accommodate them uh, because we'll be moving to a three foot distance model. So that's where things will stand throughout the rest of the year. I don't anticipate major changes. Um, at the elementary schools, you know, the last week, week, two weeks of school in June are um, mostly having kids outside. We're hoping to get as many kids as we can at Irving and Bartle to participate in the field day activities we facilitate where we're planning on doing them outdoors for, for um, as many students who might be, as might be interested. It'll be tricky, but we're we're going to um, we're, we're going to really make it a special spring as the kids um, start transitioning to summer. So speaking of summer and fall, the mantra that I have um, used among my leadership team and that the uh, staff and faculty will be hearing between now and June, and that I want to impart on our district community is moving into summer and fall. It's all it's all going to be about accelerating not remediating, accelerating. In other words, moving forward, not taking a step back, primarily because when you think of remediation, you think of a deficit model of um, teaching and learning, thinking about all the deficiencies that kids bring, not the, the, the proficiencies. And, and I'm sure the question, which I'm going to address in just another slide that uh, some of them in our uh, meeting have is, well, how, how are you going to address the deficiencies, the skill gaps that kids, uh, many kids are notably going to um, come away from this school year inheriting? We'll get to that in a second. I just want to point out again, though, why we need to move forward. In other words, next year is going to be having our kids move to the next set of curricula and not backward. Because ultimately, um, this deficit way of thinking about our kids, focusing on remediation, fixating on remediation, is going to discourage student interest in continuing learning and certainly is going to foster the learning gap. It's just never, that learning gap is, is never going to go away for some of our students. And, and for the adults in the room, um, just imagine you're, um, you're in college and you, you go to the next year, sophomore, junior, senior, and all your professors tell you, look, we're going to have to repeat a lot of what you did last year because we can't be sure that you actually got it. 
that can be a crusher. That can be a crusher. We want to look at next year as an opportunity to be reinvigorated about their learning. I just want to clarify what I mean by um, deficit-based learning and asset-based learning. It's two ways of, of, uh, of thinking about kids and how they grow academically, cognitively. We could either, as I said earlier, focus on the deficiencies or we could focus on the things that kids bring to us. Now, keep in mind that um, even though we recognize that students didn't get the same instructional contact uh, time with their teachers and, and, and those who didn't respond well to the remote learning modality um, may have flailed academically, our kids still learn things. They may not have learned book things necessarily, but I'm sure they learn how to be more tech savvy. Um, I'm sure uh, some have explored hobbies or uh, different uh, things that they thought they could do and but never had the time to do. We need to leverage those things that the kids picked up this past year. They learned in, in, in some cases how to um, manage their emotions with the help of parents and guardians. Not, not all students, but, but many did. Those are assets and we need to leverage those assets. Again, that's why we're moving forward and not remediating. So, so what does that mean? I mean? How can you possibly, as I suggested earlier, move forward, still recognizing that there are gonna be some skill gaps. We are prepared to take two approaches to helping students um, recover those gaps in knowledge, which are likely gonna be most apparent in some of the more skill intensive classes like science and, and particularly mathematics. Our INRS system has been very, very effective. Uh, every school in the state has to have an INRS committee. And it, these committees um, uh, examine, that they're, by the way, they're, they're, they're groups of teachers, counselors, the principal is always a part of the INRS committee and from time to time parents and guardians. These committees focus on um, the information that we glean from the kids work in the classroom, you know, how they're performing academically, how they're getting along with other kids. When they are referred to the committee because of great concerns, either a parent or guardian or a teacher um, has about, about the student's performance in the class. And again, performance doesn't just mean academic performance. It could mean um, things like uh, uh, at the lower grade level, how um, children are getting along with other children, how students are self-regulating their emotions, keeping them Keep keeping their emotions in check when they get upset. So we're going to leverage the successful INRS process um, when we need to identify those students who we whose skill gaps we can't address in the classroom as we move forward next year, um, and might need additional push in or in in some rare cases pull out support from additional faculty and individuals we're going to hire with some of the federal money that we received to provide additional what we sometimes call basic skills instruction. <clears throat> the main approach though to uh, helping uh, kids fill in those gaps is going to be to differentiate instruction and provide kids personalized support. Teachers are going to be exposed to more professional development, <clears throat> excuse me, in the area of differentiating instruction come the fall, those days ahead of um, the student's return. We expect a full day schedule next year, pre-pandemic like schedule, um, including the students who Governor Murphy is telling us may still qualify for virtual learning, It'll be a full day. Now, I just said earlier that I find, you know, more than four hours to be on a screen onerous. Um, the leadership team and some stakeholders in the district will likely be talking about how we can uh, accommodate the the handful of virtual learners next year um, with a full day without um, inundating them with uh, with with more screen time. Uh, we have between now and of course summer to to work through that. Um, the plans for the virtual learning students, um, whoever they may be, and we're still going to need guidance from the state uh, government and Department of Education about what standards will be used to determine who qualifies for virtual learning. Um, will be to have some minor schedule enhance enhancements, um, provide some um, some dedicated teacher to student uh, live instruction, and otherwise follow the rumor zoomer model, what I call the rumor zoomer model that we have been so far using 
um, at the upper grades. <clears throat> we'll continue to use the um, Genesis online uh, screener. Uh, we'll continue to check temperature uh, and require at this point, at this juncture, everybody to wear masks in all four schools. A lot can happen between now and fall. We'll await CDC guidelines. But what we're committed to is a full day of learning for all students uh, with all of their teachers. The first 30 days will be about um, getting our kids back in gear, rebuilding community uh, for, for um, many students, particularly at the early childhood level, restoring their, um, their uh, skill sets in the area of interpersonal relationships, self-regulation, I talked about that earlier. We want to spend those first 30 days having everybody get to know each other again in the environment they're used to, um, barring a pandemic. We also want to be sure that um, using uh, screening tools, which I'll mention in just a second, um, we are on guard for what um, the teen center at our middle and high school and I are calling COVID-19 post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I anticipate that every day for the first month, daily, and at the middle and high school, every period, we will be engaging students in circle of talk conversations. Um, we'll uh, provide professional development for our faculty to help frame those conversations. At the uh, uh, onset in September, early September, I anticipate those conversations will be you know, 15, 20, 25 minutes, and they may dwindle in, in time as, um, as the month goes on. I mentioned that we wanna use a screener uh, to be able to identify uh, students who were concerned are um, uh, still having a hard time recovering from their experiences during the pandemic. Right now, we're using successfully a screener from UCLA. It's called the UCLA Brief COVID PTSD screen, which you can Google and find out more about. Although I do believe I also have a sample of the screener on the district's website if you click the um, pandemic resources link. To provide that net, that safety net, that support for the kids uh, if they're in mental distress, mental health distress, we have very capable counselors, particularly who are, who are trained in therapeutic support at the lower grade levels. We'll leverage our uh, existing teen center group. Um, and um, we're considering contracting the Rutgers University Behavioral Health Care to provide us additional on-site regular uh, therapists, uh, depending on the number of students who we find need support. Let me take a step back and just talk about summer for a few minutes, and then I'll take questions from the board. So the the leadership team is currently framing the summer and then as i mentioned earlier in my presentation we'll engage the staff will be signed up to work this summer in um, in getting through the details the nuts and bolts of the programs the focus besides being to accelerate not to remediate is also to reinvigorate to make exciting school once again for our kids so that they can go ahead next year prepared more so in their head and their body than uh, in, in their brain. Uh, we're, we're going to offer six programs. Again, I'm just gonna very briefly touch on, on all six. Uh, the, what we're calling the SHIP program will be offered for all grades K to 12 students. Um, SHIP times will be staggered so we can provide transportation for students who um, take part. You'll learn much more about what SHIP looks like um, in two to three weeks. Essentially, it's going to be a um, a three-part program during the time frames you see on the slide. One part will focus on academic enrichment, um, which will also serve uh, at the high school level to help students recover uh, some grades for credit that they may have lost if they didn't perform well this past school year. Um, the second component of the three will focus on self-care. We're going to be um, helping our students um, learn self-care strategies like yoga and mindfulness that they can use independently, as well as engage in when they're in the SHIP program. And the third component is going to be a, a, a what I'm calling a fun component. I'll be collaborating with the local recreation department here in town. I've been meeting with um, Andrea Bay, the director 
uh, we have a standing meeting every other week to be pl to plan this this collaboration, so that the um, K uh, to seven students in the SHIP program can take part in arts and crafts activities, intramural activities, and whatever whatever else the rec department is offering. The rec department's going to schedule some activities around the SHIP schedule, so it can be within the time frame you see here. The older students will likely be working into the intramural program that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. At the lower grades, we're going to offer something I call Friends Camp. It's a focus on social emotional wellness. We ran it last year with a small number of students. It was a good program. We're hoping we could expand um, enrollment. That'll be offered to all grade, grades K to five students during the um, times you see before you. I alluded to an intramural activity where we're going to run an intramural sports camp. I already have some. Um, some rock star teachers who our kids love um, showing interest to do this. Uh, it's going to be very similar, if not the same, as the intramural program that I started, thanks in large part to um, Ann Gowan's push um, since January outdoors. Uh, the kids will take part in things like box ball, uh, track and field activities, uh, everything we can accommodate them with. That'll be only offered to grades 8 to 12 students, which we see, by the way, is an opportunity for the students who who don't qualify or don't really fit into the rec departments and tribular programs, an option to work with um, teachers they know here to do things with peers their age, their older age, uh, outdoors. Camp Invention is something we're offering. I'm really excited about this. And Dr. Nakoji has been spearheading this. We tried to run this a couple of years ago, uh, but we didn't have enough enrollment. This year, we're going to be using uh, federal grant money pending board approval to pay for every camp invention participant's tuition, uh, which is a rate of something like $250 a student. Uh, we'll use federal grant money to do that. Camp invention is a STEM project-based exploration experience for our budding scientists in grades K-5. It's gonna be a blast, a fun, engaging um, uh, four hours of, uh, of, of work. Um, and uh, two more programs, uh, we're offering something brand new uh, called Summer Music Academy. It's going to be an opportunity for uh, kids who want to pick up a new instrument like guitar uh, or a keyboard to learn some basics from our expert teaching staff who actually brought the program to our attention. So they'll, act, they'll be teaching it. That'll be offered to all grades 6 to 12 students. And finally, um, this is another new uh, program that we've never run before. We're calling it Cheer Advanced. Um, little do a lot of you know, we have a math teacher at the um, middle school, Jennifer Andrew, who has become like a beloved teacher. It's her second year. She was actually a student teacher at Irving, and we, 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 we kept her in-house, who was a Rutgers University cheerleader um, not too long ago. Uh, her, uh, she comes from a long line of cheerleaders, and so she's spearheading this effort along with Juliana Luxa to try to grow our cheer program at the uh, upper grades by working with the students at the lower grades. And, and I mentioned there were six programs, but uh, the, there is a seventh program, but it's our standard program. So I didn't want to um, deceive anybody to think that we have seven new programs. We have six new programs. The seventh program is our traditional extended school year that'll be offered to all those students whose IEPs call for such. So that's a lot to chew on. I anticipate there'll be more for me to share um, in the next few board meetings. So does the board have any questions, comments? A quick question, Scott. Sorry, I didn't get to raise my hand. Were there any other hands raised before me? That's okay, I got you. Um, yeah, just a quick question about the ESY um, program and how, what sort of, um, you know, modifications or changes will be put in place in, in kind of the standard ESY program to reflect the, you know, challenges that students who qualify for that program um, you know, have, have went through this past year as well. Because I, uh, I love what I'm hearing with the other programs, and I'm just wondering again, what sort of um, accounting is, has been taking place in terms of developing the ESY program this year. So the ES, so, so this year's ESY program is going to take into account all the modified IEPs. There were a lot of modified IEPs as a result of the pandemic. So we can pinpoint the individual, um, both cognitive and um, emotional needs that those, the kids have. That's going to be strictly aligned to the IEP. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay. But if, um, if you want I was more just information, more of, I can... yeah, just thinking more about just coming out of the remote, the year of remote learning, and what sort okay. of um, fun kind of recreational or whatever sort of enhancements are going to be added, if if any. I'll find out from Susie, our director of educational services, and get back to you. Just Marilyn, give me one second. I want to make a note. Uh, And I really appreciate the shift to an asset-based approach, um, and you know, would love to see more of this through and through um, what we do going forward. Well, you, you're, I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, I have to thank you uh, and Michelle McFadden for being uh, a force behind that initiative. Um, I did a lot of research after we began discussing in committee that concept back in probably the winter. And um, I internalized it and I saw the connection between asset and deficit-based teaching and learning to the idea of moving forward and remediation. It, there, I think there, there are real parallels there. Marilyn, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, just a couple of practical questions. Um... How many weeks? Like, when are you thinking of starting these programs, and how how much through the summer are you anticipating? Yeah, it's a great question. So the ESY program runs for six weeks. That's standard. Um, the other programs will run for a month, four weeks. Uh, I think the high school ship program we're we're thinking of having to run a fifth week um, to help those students who need to recover credit. So we might run just the high school ship program for five weeks, but everything else will be running for four weeks. Starting uh, right now, we're looking at July 6th mm -hmm. start. And again, more details will be provided ASAP. And then my, my other question, which you may not, need, not know the answer right now is, um, is there a plan, are you thinking about how to attract students to this? Again, looking at equity, getting the word out to all, you know, all, all uh, diverse levels of the community and, for, and those students who do most benefit, could most benefit from the acceleration? How are we gonna get them in? <laughs> so I think it'd be a challenge. Yeah, so so that's come up. Uh, we're not, we haven't finalized plans and it's certainly been on our mind. Um, we'll probably get to it this Thursday because we, we've, the, what I just shared with you was all finalized last Thursday. So our next step right now is to get as many staff involved as we can. We really need to staff this thing. We have so many programs being run and we need so mm -hmm. many staff. And then determine how many students we can accommodate mm -hmm. and then figure out how we're going to market this thing. We, we already know we want to identify students through INRS and, you know, just some of the usual mechanisms we've used in the past for our Title I programs, you know, mm -hmm. end of your benchmarks in terms of the kids who need the academic enrichment. But I, I want to impress upon everybody that the programs we're offering are not for students who, strictly for students who need to fill in those gaps. These are, this is for students who, who want more, who want enrichment. They want to build, capitalize on some of the hobbies that they may have explored. I mentioned that I'm sure they dabbled in. But the, but the marketing, the kids piece, that's going to come and getting the kids involved. That's going to probably come in another three weeks. We know time's of the essence because parents might be making summer plans. Mm -hmm. well, our biggest concern right now, Marilyn, before we even start thinking of students uh, in terms of numbers is making sure we have the staff. So far, 46 people have thrown their hat in the ring. We need more. Um, this is a really big lift. And, mm -hmm. and if we, we'll go outside if we have to, but there's also concern that there might not be a lot of people out there who are looking for summer jobs, knowing that they need other, a rest. Other districts are having the same issue I'm hearing because if uh, teachers are exhausted. And so to step up and do a, be really excited and enthusiastic for a new summer program, it's, it's gonna be a stretch in some, for some people. We, we recognize that. I have a trick up my sleeve that I'm not ready to share publicly, but I want because I want to talk to Anna Mark about it first. And uh, but I, I I have some ideas about how we might be able to attract more staff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michelle. Yes. So um, I wanted to say that I'm my initial reaction is all positive, except for um, my concern with who gets access to the program. So it really is for me a concern about access and opportunity um, because it would be a shame that the, you know, the parents are nabbing these spots, you know, the parents who are the most in the know, connected, word of mouth, um, 
available are, 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 are getting those spots that really what you're saying, the intention of those spots is to, you know, get all of the kids that have suffered, which we all know every one of them has in some way, but the kids who have, um, you know, really the greatest need. So I don't know how, um, you know, what kind of metric you're using to, I don't know if we want to say label or organize, you know, student groupings to make sure that, you know, the, the need is there in the way that it needs to be with limited spaces. And how are you going to address the typical problem that we find with, you know, very accelerated oriented parents nabbing the spots because they happen to be in the know before anybody else? Well, first, let me reframe what you say, started out by saying. I think you think this is positive, but you have a concern. So there's really not a negative. I think there could be a negative if we don't follow through with what um, you're suggesting, and that's make sure that we give all the kids the access. I want to make it very clear if I didn't before, this is going to be open to all kids. But your, but your, your point is well taken, as is taken um, to heart, Michelle. If we had a limited number of slots, we're going to have to figure out a very careful way to keep slots open for all kids. I get you. And, and I'll be mindful. I'll bring that to the team on Thursday. Um, in fact, I'll make a note of that uh, in just a couple of minutes. Thanks. Any other questions? Concerns? If not, that concludes my report, Mark. Scott, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, really uh, good information. And uh, uh, I think we all appreciate it. Um, I uh, wanted to make uh, one very short um, note before we move on, which is not on the agenda. So I'm going to share my screen and I will find the correct thing to share, I hope. Uh, yes. There you go. And I'm going to hit F5. Let's see. Here we go. It's coming through nicely. Okay. So we, um, I attended a meeting yesterday um, managed by the HP Vax Help Group. Um, I, I saw one or two people involved there. I think Rebecca's in our meeting tonight and uh, perhaps one or two others. Um, these are folks who have been helping people get uh, vaccinated. Um, the numbers in Highland Park of people who continue to get uh, sick with this COVID-19 are continue to be kind of too, too high. They're going down, but still too high. We need more people vaccinated. Um, the last number I saw of fully vaccinated people in Highland Park was under 25%, and that's very low. So this group has been working to get folks vaccinated. And yesterday, a meeting was run yesterday evening that um, that uh, talked about uh, the fact that high school students who are 16 and 17 years old can now get the Pfizer vaccine. Um, also, of course, anyone seven, older than 17 can get the Moderna or the Pfizer. Um, it's free, no health insurance is needed. Um, it turns out now there is much easier to get uh, appointments. I mean, it used to be that you spent hours on, online trying to get any kind of appointment. But if you simply sign up with uh, this uh, bit.ly uh, HP Vax help um, as a URL, or you send an email to hpvaxhelp at gmail.com, you can get help making an appointment. So if we have parents of 16, 17, and eight year, 18 year olds who are in the high school, in the audience, there's 57 people last time I looked in this meeting, or if you yourself need a vaccine, they will help you get an appointment. If you feel like you wanna do it yourself, CVS now has lots of appointments available. And again, as of today, uh, 16 and 17 year olds are approved for the Pfizer. So you can go to CVS, you can make appointments, uh, anyone 16 and older, or you can go directly to Hackensack Meridian Health or .org COVID-19 and make an appointment. So the point of this is our students can get vaccinated, parents can get vaccinated, community members can get vaccinated. And until enough people are vaccinated, we're still gonna be in this, this situation where it's very hard 
to do much in our society. So let's 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 get vaccinated. Of course, let's wear masks. Let's end this. So I am going to stop sharing. And done. I need to get my oh here it is. Okay. All right. So now I am gonna move on in the uh, do any board members have any questions about that? It was a very good meeting yesterday. It's just that we have almost 60 people here. I wanted to make everyone aware of this. Mark, I should add that uh, Mr. Lasseter will be distributing an email to his students and parents and guardians tomorrow about that. Wonderful. Also, as an aside, we, we ran a program from Penn Health at the Bartle School last week where 143 vaccinations were given. First on the list were our staff members. Um, and then any unused slots uh, were, you know, our educators, and um, then uh, slots were given to community members. Every one of the vaccine slots was used. That's um, 13 uh, vials with 11 doses per vial. That's 143 uh, uh, doses. Uh, second appointments were automatically made. It was Moderna, so for a month from now, uh, yep. for a second shot. And um, I visited. Um, we took some pictures, met all the people there. Uh, it was really quite an operation. It looked like what's typically done in one of these clinics or hospitals. They really turned the gym into something. So um, let's move on. Um, the um, next item on the agenda is a, is, is a motion, um, and it's to approve the um, uh, new contract with the Highland Park Administrators Association. So for the past six or eight weeks, our negotiations team has been um, negotiating with the Administrators Association. We came to an agreement. They ratified it about 10 days ago. And this resolution will um, allow us to um, sign a new contract with them. It's a five-year contract starting in um, July of 2021. So I'm going to move it. So I'd like to move that we approve the agreement between the Highland Park Board of Education and the Highland Park Administrators Association um, and uh, could I have a second, please? Second. second. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And um, we did discuss this earlier, and the board did ask the question, so I think we should go right to a vote. Uh, Linda, if you could do a roll call, please. <clears throat> Ms. Simarosti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Abstain. Ms. McFadden, Team Nicola? Michelle, you're muted. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Ms. Cruz? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. I said yes. I got, I got your yes. And Ms. Cruz, I got your yes also. Mr. Ruslevich? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. I'm, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, we're going to go on to public comment. This is the new modified format. We're going to do a 30 minute comment period. Please keep your comments to three minutes each. Um, and if you have more to say, and if there are more commenters, you can comment after the board does its uh, regular business. We have a very short agenda tonight. So it's the, the wait should not be that long. So item 12, public comment, the Board of Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and is reserved this time for your comments. Board policies 164 and 167 establish and regulate the right of the public to participate in public meetings. Please raise your blue virtual hand. Um, give us your name and your address before speaking, please. Um, Christine Hirsch, please. Hi, good evening. Christine Hirsch, 333 Felton Avenue. Um, I just feel very confused about the whole math. I have a current sixth grader and 
you know, I hear what's been say, said like about the Iowa readiness test and giving kids these tests to assess them, going to the homes to assess them. But how are you even going to potentially do this if they haven't fulfilled curriculum? And I just don't understand how this keeps them on track to get where other kids were able to get to in previous year, years. I can answer that question for Christine, Mark. So it's, Christine, um, it's our intention, depending on the numbers of students who elect to take the test and show some proficiency to provide them some support in the summer. Uh, the support would likely look like a modified SHIP program. Uh, if the numbers are small enough and the number of students who actually want that support are small enough, we might even be able to provide carve out a whole different uh, program. We can be flexible about that, but summer would be the time to, to, to help them. It's similar to a program that I've been talking to the, um, uh, the equity and excellence in the curriculum committee about regarding advanced placement and honors classes. Um, it's a little premature, but I'll just plant a seed. We're looking at uh, running a, um, a summer program next summer for students who want to take an honors or AP class in order to provide them more access. So Christine, we would love to be doing the same thing this summer. I mean, I, I appreciate hearing that, but I guess it confuses me with your whole model of tracking and not tracking. Doesn't that gear towards tracking? Which it, I fully support, especially in things such as math, because I don't think it's fair to keep all kids in one class, regardless of their level of, edu of, level of skill, because that's the challenge for all the students and the teachers. So are you referring to seventh grade algebra and the idea that we might be tracking kids at that level? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, Christine, I, I mean, this is a longer conversation, which I'd be glad to have with you outside of a board meeting. But I can tell you initially, the committee that worked on this um, hasn't discussed seventh grade yet. We wanted to see how we manage sixth grade, but it is our intention to do something similar with seventh and eighth grade. We, I, I doubt we'll ever get to a point, it'd be ideal, I doubt we'll ever get to a point where we can have one single level in grade seven and eight, but um, but we're looking to reduce the number of levels, but that's not gonna happen in the near, near future, Christine. So if kids are still gonna be able to learn on par with like, like-minded like students, what, what whatever level it is, if that makes sense? In seventh and eighth grade? Yes. Correct. Okay, and then, um. Just to, to go back, you didn't mention the extra summer support for the math. Am I correct on that? So that would be in addition to what you suggested? Yes, yes, I did, because that's not, that's going to be a, it's a program in waiting only if needed. Again, as I said earlier, depending on the number of kids who qualify and the number of students who actually want that help. I guess it's, as a parent, I would just ask to let parents know, because again, they have to secure you know, spots for summer camps. And I, I know many parents, you know, regardless of equity, would try to do the most they can to help their children. Yep. Okay. And um, the other thing I did want to bring to the board's attention is the current state of the track being unusable for track meets and perhaps dangerous. And I know, Scott, you had emailed me back um, your response. And, you know, it's kind of a limbo kind of answer. Like, um, yeah. and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it's, this is important to the community. It's not only something that serves, you know, our middle school, our high school, the children who do the soccer programs there, you know, let alone Mark, just the community. So Mark, what do you is wanna, the actual plan and timeline for that? Do you want to comment on that, Mark? Yeah. So we've been working for two years with the borough and the county to try to uh, put the money aside for this. And with the pandemic, we've run into one a hold up after the other and we're continuing to work on it. Um, I think um, if you wanna know more about that, you should talk to Dr. Taylor offline, but yeah. we are working on it. We know it's in very bad shape. We know the field's in bad shape and we have put money aside. Um, we have put money aside. Rob, did you wanna comment? I, I just wanted to say we have, put, you know, as you're just about to say, we have money that is budgeted that, that for our portion of it, and um, this is, uh, the idea is that this is going to be funded from multiple areas. The county uh, originally was supposed to, or we thought was going to be part of this, but certainly the town as well. So we're waiting to uh, kind of get that all coordinated. But, but our 
portion of it, our money is that we have set aside. I mean, that's really, really good to hear. But again, two years turns into three years, turns into four years. We can go back and look at the Bartle playground and the fact that nothing has been done on this borrowed equipment from Irving that's now rusted. So again, you know, efforts were made to revitalize the Bartle playground. Nothing happened. Money is set aside. I don't want to see this same thing happening to a community resource. And like, what can we do as parents to facilitate this? And yes, I know it's a bigger conversation. Oh, Excuse me, call your state legislators, call the county. That's what we've been doing. We, some of us have been busting our butt to try to get them to get come up with the money that they promised us. Um, we have very few, um, we have very, very few resources with the 2% cap on us to put aside a million dollars for a new track and field. So it has to come from multiple resources we will do what we can and it's not going to wait two, three, four more years, but it's very, very difficult to get any of these organizations to move. The borough is very uh, eager to help us and work with us. They have the same issues and the, and the, this might have been done by now, except for, and not to blame everything on the pandemic. This might have been done by now, but the pandemic didn't help us. And it certainly put the county aside where they are virtually unwilling to help us or anyone else. So uh, it will be done. We have put money aside. We're trying to coordinate it. We have about half a million dollars put aside. Um, that will um, use up all of our. Um, that will use up all of our um, capital uh, uh, funds. But uh, we're working on it. So I can say I would like to go on. Oh, Anne, did you have a comment? Yeah, just real quick. Um... I know, I appreciate you said that about the county because my understanding was we were expecting a county grant and it did not come through at the last minute. So that's why it's not happening right now, like we hoped, or you know, whenever people are not on the track. Um, Dr. Taylor, is there a way to make parts of the track, specific parts of the track safe to do short-term repairs as we did on the field? We or is that do not it possible? We examined that option, but we can't do oh. it for the track. We could do it for the field, which we did, you recall, we last did, year. Right. But there's but no way to... Track. No, okay. it's either replacement. The money we would have to commit to uh, updating it would not be far off from actually replacing it. Right. Thank you. Um, Rebecca Hirsch, you're, you were next with your hand up. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, Rebecca Hirsch, 331 Felton Avenue. Um, I wasn't going to talk about the track, but just um, when Mark mentioned that we should call our legislators and we should, you know, call the county, what would be super helpful, because I think that we're a good community and we are good at mobilizing and organizing, if um, the district could just send like a few bullet points about like specifically what we could do to help. I really feel like everybody would pitch in, like we, the whole town would end up calling and bugging, you know, whoever we need to bug. So if you guys t give us the info, I really feel like we can mobilize to help as much as we could. I think, you know, a lot of people want to help and we know you guys are working really hard and it's an uphill battle. Anyway, um, so, um, oh, just really quick, I'm, I got distracted by the track news, but, um, Really quick, um, regarding the summer programs, they sound wonderful, and um, I'm really glad that the district is working at um, pulling those together. I do think that a lot of kids who might need help might not be flagged for help and or might not be able to come over the summer for whatever reason, you know, family reasons, camp reasons, like just, you know, maybe like they need full day something and they just can't do these partial day workshops. Um, which is not your fault, but um, so is there going to be a way that kids could make up some of the curriculum if they aren't able to do it over the summer? And I, I was going to, I'm tying this in with um, a letter that was just sent by um, over 70 parents signed a letter to the board and Dr. Taylor um, asking for live instruction to come back on Wednesdays. Right now, um, there's not, if for the middle school and high school right now, there's not real um, sort of standardized live instruction on Wednesdays. And we have a whole marking period left and that would be a way to make up some of the lost ground. You know, I understand, you know, it's been, it's been a crazy year, um, but bringing back more formalized instruction on Wednesdays could help make up some of the lost ground um, to get 
kids better prepared for next year and sort of get them in a regular five day a week schedule, even with the half days, like, you know, that's fine. Um, so I just wanted to bring that. I'm not going to read the whole letter because I'm um, calling from my phone at another meeting. So I can't read the letter, but it was signed by over 70 parents. So a lot of, a lot of people support it. And um, hopefully it's something that people are willing to explore for the final marking period. Uh, thank you. Scott, do you have a comment? Rebecca, I'll follow up with you tomorrow about that letter. Okay, great. Um, Carol McCarty, please. Hi, Carol McCarty, 43 Harrison Avenue. Um, I just wanted to follow up with something that uh, I had asked at the last meeting, and I think Dr. Taylor mentioned that he would follow up on it tonight, was um, just to confirm that are, are, is, are all staff going to come back in May? When will that happen? And what's the plan for if there are staff members who can't come back for whatever their reason is, um, will, the, will there be substitutes found for those people um, for in-person instruction? Sort of what basically what the plan is for staff coming back, for more of the staff to come back to in-person instruction. I'm still committed to bringing everybody back May 3rd, uh, particularly at the middle of the high school. That hasn't changed. Um, right now, I'm only aware of three individuals at the middle of the high school who have uh, still have good reason to be home. And they'll continue, we'll continue the model that we're using currently. So students who are in person for any of those three teachers will have to go to a class and zoom out to the individuals. Cal, I, 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 you may not like that answer. I need to let you know, it, there is absolutely no way I'm going to find a certified, particularly a capable certified teacher to replace any teacher who must still remain home. But I wanna clarify that everyone, but right now the three individuals um, will be coming in. That's great news. I, I like that news. I'm happy to hear that that many um, staff members are going to be coming back. Um, and is that also the plan for the fall that, you know, say, for example, if those who however many staff members cannot come back for in person instruction in the fall, which you've said you are shooting for full time in, in person instruction for everyone. Have you started conversations about that? for the fall, given the fact that it sounds like there's a shortage of workforce and this might take a little bit of extra planning and mm -hmm. work. So Carol, yeah, there's been a lot of internal discussion about the fall. Uh, I'll re-echo what I said in my presentation. Um, it's going to be a traditional, as traditional as we can get at school year, at least by schedule. Um, everybody will be back. I'm not prepared to provide more details that you would like because I haven't spoken to my faculty yet about some of the internal conversations the leadership team have had and I've had with board members. But as soon as I'm prepared to do that, Carol, I will. It'll certainly be before the end of the school year. Excellent. And my last question was um, about the curriculum that's gonna be covered this year. At the last meeting, you ha I had asked the question that, I was really concerned that based on our children going to school for what is basically half days all year long and not really having new instruction on Wednesdays, how much of the sixth grade curriculum is my sixth grader going to cover? And I know that you're trying to concentrate on trying to not concentrate on this deficit, but the fact is, is that each grade probably isn't going to cover what is in each of those grades curriculums. So I'm still not clear on how we as a district are going to move forward with this. If I can prepare a model that would exemplify what a teacher will be doing next school year to cover what may have been missed, I like to refer to it as filling in skill gaps. Mm -hmm. So. And but by the way, Carol, we're talking mostly about the skill intensive subject areas, um, science and math in particular. If I can bring a model to show the board and the community to you all soon, I will. That's probably the best way. So you can see visually 
for me to explain what it would look like next year. That'd be great. Thank you. Sure. M Michelle, did you have something to say? Yeah, I, I just, I don't know if all of the parents commenting heard Dr. Taylor's presentation, but he seemed to be very clear to me that we were going to not be forcing um, the curriculum that we missed to be caught up per se. It, it, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Right. That that is not that is not something that we are focused on doing, for all of those reasons that Dr. Taylor was good enough to go into much detail about. So maybe maybe that would make some of the parents feel a little better if they watch that presentation again. Okay, th thank you, um, Jennifer's iPad. I don't know which Jennifer that yeah. is, but you have the Jenna you have the floor. Yes, hi, sorry, Jennifer's iPad is Jennifer Altman. Oh, hi, Jennifer. Everyone, Walter. Uh, I, I have you guys on my iPad so I can have my computer up. It's like, you know, the world of two screens this year, right? Um, so uh, uh, thank you. Great presentations and everything. I uh, really good. Um, I did. Um, I, I actually want to make another point, but just getting back to the Wednesdays, um, I would love to see the middle school and the high school go back to the um, swapped AB schedule for Wednesdays. Um, not just because they can cover more curriculum. Um, and I know even like in my, my, my son is taking a bunch of AP classes and they just can't cover the curriculum. So those teachers are even just kind of running classes on Wednesday, which is a credit to them. But I do think that's a shame that the other, I think all middle school and high school students need to get, um, if we could switch back to that AB schedule where there's uh, real classes on Wednesdays and especially for the kids that are going in, since they're coming in, there's one cohort going in now and we don't need the deep clean. Um, it would be huge to get those kids in five days a week, especially since a lot of those kids are kids that don't respond to remote learning at all. So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to do one more push to really consider bringing the Wednesday instruction back for um, the, the last quarter, because it's there's some real time to recap some of this lost curriculum. Um, but but so just wanted you to consider that um, the, the point I wanted to make, um, or it's really a question. Um, uh, as I probably stated, I have one child that did not respond at all to remote learning. Um, so, you know, that's what it is. And her deficit was, you know, 13 months of lost school. Um, and we can't really risk, yeah, you know, I'd be a negligent parent if I let that sort of happen again next year. So, you know, I have to know whether I need to consider, you know, other options, private, charter, moving, whatever. But I, I'm not concerned because Dr. Taylor, I really appreciate your your plans for the fall and they look wonderful and exciting, especially for parents of children that just couldn't do what happened this year and, and not necessarily necessarily at fault of the schools, but it just was a lost, it was a whole lost year. And and speaking about the social emotional, it's it's not even mental health, it's this sense of how they've reframed who they are as a student, how they've reframed who what they're what their abilities are. And I hate to see that last, especially when we talk about ad young adolescents and teens. So I just wanted to make a plug at this kind of April mark that when you think of the fall, and I know you're playing primarily to have it be all in person and only remote, you know, if it's necessary to have remote, whether it's health or safety or whatever, that, that all common classes at least have some sections where there's no computer involved in the teaching and learning in the classroom. I think sure. the Zoomers and rumors or whatever we call it, that that killed killed the education for students who cannot be taught from a computer. They just can't. And I think we probably have enough kids in the district that it would be essential that certain sections of all the common classes, I know like there are certain high school classes that there's only one section or two section that might be hard to do. But we have sections in all the middle and high school for common classes where there are sections where there is no zooming going on because there's two, we can't, we can't risk another year of lost education for students who cannot be taught through a screen. And I mean, it sounds so silly, right? It seems so obvious. Some humans cannot be taught by a screen. That's why they don't take online classes or go to online charters or right? They have to be taught by a human being to a human being. So just please make sure that you have some, every common class, middle through high school, has some sections that students that cannot be taught half through a computer have the option to be taught human to human as it had been done, you know, prior to the pandemic. 
So thank you. Thank you for listening. Jen, thanks so much. Um, Andrea, you'll be our last speaker in this section because we're just about out of time. And then anyone who wants to speak after the board goes through our short agenda is welcome to speak at that time. So Andrea, take over. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you so much. Andrea Alexander, 116 North 3rd Avenue. Um, just following up on a concern I raised with Dr. Taylor um, earlier today, my, I, I don't think it's an exagger exaggeration to say that my daughter has not had more, she's an in-person student at Irving, and she hasn't gone more than two weeks in person without there being a quarantine this year. Um, I know you know, Dr. Taylor said she, her class is kind of an exception. There have been, for whatever reason, a lot of cases in this one class. Um, so it's just the luck of the draw. But I, I like cannot express how disruptive, how damaging this has been. I feel like I made the wrong choice sending her in person because when she was remote, she would get to go to an app, uh, sort of like an after school program at a private daycare in town and she got to socialize and she got to go outside and she got to play and she had a lot of fun. And even though it wasn't an ideal situation and, you know, like all the other first graders, she's really distracted on Zoom and I don't know how much she's really learning. At least she was socializing and having some kind of like, I don't know, positive experience. And these quarantines are, she's stuck in the house. I'm working. I can't pay attention to what she's doing on Zoom. I, I there's like no words to express unless you've gone through what our situation has been, how detrimental this year has been for her and been for our family. It's just so it's so stressful. It's so damaging. And all I just want to say is I I understand. You know, there's still a lot of concern about the virus. There's still a lot of questions, and like this the situation isn't going to change this year. Um, but I just want to say, in all the planning for the fall, I think it's really important that we also look at the quarantine situation and the quarantine rules. I know my understanding is that some districts have like a six foot rule that you identify the children that maybe sit around the desk that are the closest and maybe they zoom in, but not the whole class is shut down. I'm just hoping the fall we can sort of reassess the situation so there aren't classes where they only get two weeks at a time in person and then they're home for 10 days because it's not, it's not sustainable for anybody. Andrea, so. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so I'd like to go on to our agenda. Um, so um, Michelle, could you um, present us with uh, any committee reports and also your agenda items? Yes, um, I have to do a little shuffling around of screens here, but I just, um, wanted to say that tonight's committee report was actually written by Monique. Um, we had a joint committee meeting uh, where curriculum and uh, equity and excellence combined. And one of our members um, sat out, uh, that was Marilyn. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, so that we did not, uh, you know, reach uh, the numbers that, you know, would necessitate a public meeting. So um, we had a joint meeting because we had so much work to discuss that um, really could have been taken on by either of our committees. And so we just decided to um, attack these problems jointly. Um, so I'll get back to the agenda review. That's item number one on our, um, our committee report, but... Um, and this should be, by the way, in everyone's email to uh, review. Um, number two, it was our uh, summer grade recovery program, which Dr. Taylor provided um, the district with all of the details in his report just now. Um, and there is a component there that we did discuss in committee, which was creating some kind of culture change in regards to assessment and grading um, so that we would be um, evolving, I would say, to a more authentic assessment approach. And, um, you know, talking less about um, percentage grading and more about authentic assessment. And so, you know, Rob, during our meeting did raise um, an important point. What you know, what do we do when we have students and faculty and, you know, families internalizing conventional grading systems and then having some sort of culture change um, presented to them? And so um, 
it's important that we just make it very clear that we we all did recognize the importance of doing a grading culture change that would be you know respectful of all of the beliefs that we hold um, on the conventional system of grading so that this would not be uh, a forced type of change that you know came from administration down but that we would have some real honest conversations about the conventional grading system and how we can improve um, our idea of assessment when we when we push for authentic assessment um, the third item we discussed was the um, language education um, Basically, we, you know, this comes from the conversation that we had about leveled reading and um, anti-Black linguistic racism. So we had a really wonderful discussion about um, the idea of languages that we perceive to be acceptable and unacceptable, really. That's um, the big picture take on it, but that um, there is a lot of our understanding of how children come to school speaking, specific to the um, the American Black community and the conversational and linguistic skills that are, you know, uh, um, not they are not validated in the public school system, um, and that, that you know this is this is part of a larger conversation. Um, on anti-racism and anti-classism as well. Um, so this was a rich conversation and um, we did have two articles that um, we discussed and the links, there's um, links inside of your committee report um, in your email if, uh, if you'd like to read those. I really do hope that we all get some time to read those articles and discuss this further. Um, which we plan to do, obviously, at our next meeting. Um, now, related to that, we talked about um, other issues of language arts, um, this specifically involving leveled reading. So we talked about leveled reading groups, um, and this is kind of in relation to our tracking conversations of the past, but also making um, sure that our leveled reading groups are not stagnant and that we're not um, saddling kids with ideas of themselves before they are really um, fully fluent readers, you know. So making sure that our leveled readers are um, appropriate, and that means, you know, appropriate to their interest, as well as their current ability and challenging them as well, but also making sure that um, we have uh, reading groups in place in the classrooms that have various levels um, so that kids are not self-identifying and identifying others in the class as good or bad readers. And so there was an article that is um, also relevant included in your email there. It's leveled reading groups don't work. That's the, um, sounds like clickbait, but it's not. It's uh, leveled reading groups don't work link in your email. Um, and then we did have to um, finish up our formal meeting, but some of us did stay around and we just discussed one other item and that was the High Tops um, Sex and Family Life Education Program proposal. Um, and again, the link is there. Um, and we didn't really get too far into that conversation, but um, the proposal did look good. We didn't, I don't think that we identified any issues with that. Um, we also had some other things that we did not get to. Uh, that was the, um, generally, unfortunately, we didn't get to a lot of the policy updates. Um, we just ran out of time. Um, and that is the report from both curriculum and equity and excellence. And I'm hoping that if there's anything that I missed, Monique, you can, um, you know, fill in the blanks. Uh, during equity and excellence. And I think last thing I need to talk about is item number one, which was the agenda review. Um, and there's just 
one item, and that is the resolution to approve a new music course of intro to acoustic guitar for grade levels nine through 12 as an elective. And that would be for five art credits for the high school, um, effective September 1st, 2021. And there is um, an attachment to the agenda um, giving details about that. But um, that concludes my report for tonight. Michelle, thank you. Any board members have any questions or comments? Uh, Darcy. Hello. Yeah, I'm just wondering if I missed something or if I'm possibly remembering incorrectly, which is also entirely possible. Um, on our last agenda, didn't we table stuff about the um, the stuff for the Wilson versus um, Sorry, the dyslexia. Yes, uh, Orton Gillingham. Thank you. Didn't we yeah. table this? I don't see that back. We're, so I'm holding off until next board meeting because I, I, I want Michelle Rodriguez to be sure she addresses any concerns the board may have okay. that were echoed okay. last time. No matter how it comes back, we'd still be on time to do whatever we wanted to do. Yeah. Well, yeah, there was professional development. Um, and I think we, 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 were, we only missed two workshop opportunities, but there are plenty others that are upcoming. Gotcha. Okay, wonderful. Good memory, Darcy. Well, <laughs> really good. clearly, like, remember there was a thing, but all of the details we did not so much. Very good. You know, the, the leveled reading conversation was actually out of that conversation exactly. with uh, Orton Gillingham. Yeah. So it yeah. was just, uh, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I experienced all of that in this district, you know, for years. But it is still, it is still, uh, it is still there. The heart is still beating, and uh, we're working on it. I like it. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Darcy. Any anyone else? Okay. If not, I'm going to present the finance and facilities. We did not have a meeting which necessitated a report. Uh, we did do the uh, budget presentation the last time, and uh, we'll be more, there'll be more on that at the next uh, at the first May meeting. Um, there's the usual uh, bill lists, the uh, travel reimbursement reports, and number three, uh, we have uh, resolutions approving contractors for professional services. Um, so we have uh, Dennis uh, Sheeran doing uh, professional development for high school math teachers. And their interim healthcare doing um, a student, uh, uh, sorry, nursing services per students IE, IEPs uh, from uh, today through the end of the uh, school year. Um, we have a resolution number five to um, accept sustainable Jersey for schools grant by the NJEA in the amount of $10,000. Uh, that'll fund participation in the Little Sisters in the Know program at Bartle. Uh, to build high esteem and foster a positive self-image in African-American girls. Um, I wanted to thank uh, uh, NJEA for that grant. And also, um, uh, 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 Scott has, uh, thanks Scott, has brought in the person who uh, put together this Little Sisters in the Know program, uh, who I believe is a daughter of one of our ex-teachers here. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's wonderful. Um, so number, number six is to um, accept a an Highland Park Education Foundation mini grant to Alec, Alex Brumell, uh for $300 to assist uh, the tuition cost for a certificate program embodied social uh, justice. Um, number seven <clears throat> was the submission of a grant application for the 2020 safety grant through NJSIG um, in the amount of uh, $1,586. For, um, for the next school year, uh, June, uh, July of uh, 2021 to uh, June of 2022. Um, eight is the approval of the contract renewal with Source for Teachers to provide the substitutes uh, and uh, no increase in rates. Uh, there's a rate schedule that was attached, but there are no increases. Uh, numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, number nine and 10 are, um, students who've, um, two, well, number nine are two new students in the district who are gonna be uh, placed into uh, out of district placements. 
Um, item 10 is an out of district transfer from one school to another. And item 11 is purchasing of UVC light automated disinfection uh, units uh, for uh, bathrooms across the school district. <clears throat> and this, this is, excuse me, I ran out of water. This is for $27,000, but that's coming from federal CARES money. And that's the list. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this? Uh, Darcy. Uh, yeah, um, you know, this is one of those tricky things, and I know we talked about this, you know, when he brought it up in terms of the budget, um, but, you know, my eyes kind of rolled into the back of my head when I saw those numbers for the, the three out of district placements and wondering what that does to our budget for next year. We're, we're looking into that now. <laughs> These are new students who just came to our doorstep from other districts. So more details and when Mark provided the new 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 yeah. students, that's that raises a great big old red flag and a switch of a school. I don't know if that's a, a you know a net gain, net loss, you know, like but then it raises the question. You're looking at like then possibly two hundred thousand dollars worth of new expenses that we did not account for in our budget. So that's a huge deal. And I think you know, I think these are the things that, you know, folks who really don't understand when they think about a public school budget and how easy it is to get your budget set, you think you're great, and then, you know, and it's not, of course, we have to provide services for all kids and give them what they need, but it's very hard to keep up with these costs. It's a biggie. The and the federal government does so little and it really is, it's all falling on the local taxpayer. And when we're held to that 2% cap, it becomes shifting all of these funds into our special education budget, but they've got to come from somewhere. So they're coming out of the general education budget. And it's it's it just gets worse every year. It just gets worse. It's unsustainable. It's terrifying. It's terrifying that, you know, two, three potentially, you know, super costly placements fall out of the sky right as we've settled our, bu our budget. Sorry, done, ran over. Uh, Mike, you're muted. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, this always comes up. We have to provide these services. It's of course, we're legally and morally obligated, but um, we, and, and Darcy, part of the answer is that we don't always get students moving in. You know, sometimes students move out who are in special ed programs and another district pays, but it seems that it's always going up. I think part of it may be that we're providing very good services. And so people move here, they like the school system um, and they maybe have a few kids or more, you know, more than one child and someone goes out of district. And it's in this case, we're talking about at least 140,000 new. And I don't know how much extra the strength school costs over the Rutgers uh, Behavioral Health Care Center, but it's certainly likely to cost us extra. This might be as much as 160 or $170,000 that we did not budget. You're completely right. Um, Chris, you had your hand up first. Uh, yeah, since Darcy brought up the, the subject of the sort of, you know, lo long-term budget issues, I mean, I, I have this sort of general impression that we're about a year away from a, a financial crisis, uh, which I don't know if I'm right or not, I, you know, just based on the figures that were uh, presented at the last meeting. Is, is that wrong? I mean, one thing we don't know is the federal aid situation. Do you know how much money we're likely to get from the new? Uh, um, we're going to get millions of dollars. The question is, uh, how can we spend it or can uh, we spend it? Also, it's one time money. We can't we can't put the money towards like, oh, we're going to hire 10 more teachers to do all the special ed because right. the money goes away and those teachers go away or, or mm. not. Um, so that's, that's not the answer. Um, mm. one, of the answers, one of the answers is that we have saved money um, during the pandemic. Uh, this is the first year since I've been on the board recently in you know, five years where we didn't have a crisis making the budget. You know, what are we going to cut? What are we going to cut? And we even were able to put extra money into surplus. So we haven't had surplus. The surplus has been going away. Um, the surplus is better than it's been. It's not great. I mean, we have enough there to, for instance, do a, good, a 
reasonable portion of the track and field, you know, that we've talked about. Um, I think the long, it's not a year or two away. It's probably not four years away. The problem is with a 2% cap and uh, certain costs going up astronomically like healthcare and special ed costs, it's a, a systemic, not maintainable position that the local school districts are in in New Jersey. It's not only us, it's everyone. It's not sustainable when healthcare, healthcare, you know, has kind of gone down slightly this past year because of the new chapter 44 law that caps certain costs in healthcare for our staff. But um, so that's been, that's been a, a savings. Uh, the state did give us more aid because our special ed costs went up a lot more than in previous years. So that's helped us. But so the next year or two or three, I think is not a problem. Actually, it's probably better than we've been. The real problem is with 2% caps and healthcare going up 10% some years and special ed costs going up by two, three, four million some years, it's not sustainable. That's the real issue. And I don't know, again, you know, talk about talking to our legislators. It doesn't seem to fall on ears that are listening. And, and all this money that's coming our way, um, we were allocated $1.1 million in um, ESER 2, ESER 2 CARES money. That's the grant from December last year when, when uh, the old administration was leaving, the Congress uh, passed that. That money is somewhat, um, is somewhat earmarked. So we have to be, to, to spend it all will be difficult, um, especially on what I'm gonna call old programs or old needs. If we could, our surpluses could build up enough that we would have a four or five year window. You know, we could do the track, we could do the field. We'd have a window where we'd have surpluses that we won't run out because we only get 2% increases. But 2% increases or even 3% increases aren't enough. It's really a problem. And so I'm gonna stop, but I don't think we're in any crisis right now. In fact, I know we're not. Um, I think Michelle, you were next and then Rob, R Russ Levitch. Yeah, I, I think it's important for us to, you know, as the, as the Board of Ed, maybe to try to educate the situation, you know, at the situation, to educate the public about the situation that public schools like ours are in. Um, when we have a 2% cap, that means that we can't go above that and get local tax dollars. We don't wanna raise local taxes, but we need the money. There's no way for us to get it from the state. There's no way for us to get it from the federal government. And when we have governors in our past um, making these types of political decisions to put a 2% gap on local taxes, they get to say they did a wonderful job for the local taxpayer um, because they don't, you know, they don't want us to uh, bloat the budget and we shouldn't be using, you know, tax dollars in effectively, but we still have the requirements from the federal and the state um, education administrators, I guess, from the Board of Eds um, in those two places telling us what we can and can't do. Um, I don't know that everyone appreciates that, that we have um, really a targeted um, war going on um, against us. And it is in the name of, you know, privatization and corporate profit. And that's, that's what it is. I mean, whether it is a Democrat or a Republican, we are still dealing with the same things. It's, it's really important that people don't go to sleep in this time of, um, you know, Democrats being in office for, you know, for what it's worth in New Jersey, we have a Democratic governor. Um, it doesn't seem to make a big difference as far as our school budget goes. So I, I hope that we all understand what the problem is. And, you know, when we have lots of uh, people very frustrated and, you know, rightfully so, um, this is not the place to come with those types of frustrations because there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, 
you know, yes, you can, you can hold each other's hands and say, you know, we understand because we're all paying taxes as local residents. But um, I, I don't know what we can do, honestly, without some federal and state um, uh, money. I mean, they owe us well over $6 million pandemic aside because of the funding formula of years past. So, I mean, yeah, the track looks terrible. <laughs> I mean, end of rant. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Rob. Yeah, Rob. Uh, a separate topic I'm curious about item number 11 uh, underlying, but I'm just curious as to what kind of system it is and who's installing it and then what's the long term? I'm, I'm just concerned that we're purchasing something, even though we're using CARES money, it's not necessarily feeling like it's coming out of our pocket now, but in two years, three years, four years, what's our maintenance cost on it? And is it something that we, you know, where's the recommendation coming from to purchase this uh, disinfection system? And what's the long-term viability and do we even really want it? Um, the, 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 we heard in finance, uh, or perhaps I heard directly from Dr. Taylor was, that we can't really control what happens when someone goes in the bathroom, whether masks come off, kids are congregating, whatever. So these are going into bathrooms to do serious uh, you, you know, UVC light automatic disinfection. Um, and it may lose its benefit uh, 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 when we're not, you know, when this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic is gone, we may not care about this. Um, I don't know if our administration has anything to add, but um, one of the problems we have is they give us a million dollars. I mean, this is a, a, it's a real use for now. This is a serious use and is worthwhile doing. They give us a million dollars. We can't buy a million dollars worth of masks, right? They have a list of what we can use the money for. A lot of it is unclear if we can spend the money on this or that or the other. This is something we clearly can spend the money on and we wanna keep the kids safe in the schools when they're on, not under supervision. Uh, Scott, do you have anything to add to that? It's uh, very I, frustrating. I'm looking at some of the documentation that Michael O'Donnell shared with the central leadership team. I think that's the meaning which you heard about this, Mark. Yes. Uh, the answer to your question about installation, Rob, we're gonna do that internally with our own people, Eddie and Willie in particular. Um, I have a doc spec sheet on it. I could send you if you'd like, um, since we're not voting on it tonight. Thank you. I appreciate that. Might that. Be helpful. I, yeah, I'll do I that do, uh, momentarily. I do want to add one small uh, thing, which is uh, something um, about um, taxes and savings. Um, if there's new redevelopment, taxes may go down, but we can still only raise the budget 2%. And that 2% is a fixed amount, but by the time the taxes get computed because there's a new tax base, your tax bill may not go up. Well, those of you in the audience may not know it, but in two of the last five years, your tax bill didn't go up. Part of that is new development has happened. We raised to we raised the our numbers two percent, and I'm putting that in quotes, but we don't really see any benefit. We get that whatever the number is, 800,000, that's what we can raise. Perhaps uh, new special ed programs cost us a million, so we had to cut somewhere. Perhaps the health care cost, the health insurance cost went up 1.2 million, we had to cut somewhere. Um, also, if we refinance bonds, uh, Linda has worked with our bond folks and we've refinanced bonds twice. That saves us a fortune, so that's a fantastic thing. We're saving money but it's on your tax bill. Your tax bill doesn't go up. We're not, we're not getting more money to run the schools. So it's really a problem. I, I want to just you know, give the whole point out. It's, it's really, really a problem. But um, I do want to add to Chris, we're not going broke and we're not going to go broke in the near term because we've put a little bit more money, maybe more than a little bit more money away in surplus but it's really a bad situation. It's been a bad situation since I first joined this board five years ago. Um, it's much worse than it was in past years, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years ago. Darcy? Mark, if I could, one potential ray of hope is that Biden did campaign on tripling title, 
And in his budget, he did ask for more than double trip our car and triple one funding, our title right. one fund. So yeah, I saw that. That that would help. It's it not would help solve the problem, but it will absolutely help. If we were to just get more funding that's not tied to mandates, that in and of itself would be miraculous. And as Marcus said, this that you know the CARES funding, while helpful. You know, it goes along with that federal stipulation of supplement, not supplant. Here's money, but you can only use it for these things. Even if you have this huge budget gap over here of, you know, $600,000, you can't use it for that. You can't use it for stuff you were already paying for. You can only use it for these things. And sometimes that doesn't help. Like now we've got a million dollars to burn, but maybe we don't even necessarily need that million dollars. So it's, it's kind of crazy making. And there's more coming that we're not going to know how to spend if we yeah. read the newspapers. It's insane. It's insane. Oh, and by the way, some of you have heard me said this before, but I can't resist. When I was on the school board 30 years ago, we were getting, we were paying 20 or 30 percent of our special ed costs, and the state was covering the rest. And we were all outraged. Why aren't they covering it all? You know, it should be the state's responsibility. Now we're getting a tiny fraction of that. It's really, it's really a shame. It's, it's really makes it. And there wasn't a two percent cap. We were getting six, seven, eight percent increases. There was a lot of inflation then, but we were getting six and seven and eight percent increases, and it was still hard. But this is way worse. This is so much harder and so much worse. Um, something is going to break. But I think Chris, not now, because we have time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on, please. Um, it's getting late. Um, Anne, could you do the personnel? Sure, thanks. All right, so uh, we met on April 12th. I sent out some uh, rough minutes. Um, almost everything is confidential. We talked about staff potentially to be non-renewed. We talked about staff potentially to receive promotions. Uh, we talked about uh, potential employment litigation. And we reviewed the personnel policy on tonight's agenda. Um, my impression of it, sorry, that is number 4125, employment of support staff members. My impression of it is that it's clarifying, Strauss Esme is recommending that we adopt certain semantic and generally clarifying changes and that it's not a substantive, not a recommended substantive uh, amendment. So please do look over the policy as Darcy will tell you, but. It's, it's not particularly interesting. Nonetheless, it's still, I think, important that we adopt Strauss Esme's changes so that next time Strauss Esme proposes a substantive change, it'll be easy for us to compare the new document with the document we have, which will look like Strauss Esme's underlying document. Okay, so uh, let's see. On the agenda, almost everything is uh, self-explanatory. Um, so I'm not gonna go through everything. Maternity leaves, leaves. We do have two new staff coming on board. We welcome Emily Schubert, special education teacher at Bartle. Is she uh, already been working with us as a student? Yes, teacher? very yeah. successfully, which is why we'd like to keep keep her going. So we're delighted. Welcome yep. Emily uh, and uh, Yaritza Racinos, paraprofessional at the high school. Welcome to you, Ms. Racinos. Um, it's transfers, ah, number 10. Baseball, thank you to Mr. Copperthwaite for stepping up and being the middle school baseball coach. Um, after school program assistance. Um, but number 11, I, actually I had forgotten about this, the before after school program staff. Yep. Uh, sure you have your eyes it. on we, it. Yeah, take your time. Keep... Uh, correct. Okay, do you have a question I, about that? Yeah, yeah, I did. I just wanna make sure you had a chance to see what number 11 was. Um, it says when the program is operating. The program is currently operating, correct. the current is now operating, right? Okay, yep. so when Bartle or Irving students uh, go to school for a half day, are they then, uh, does after school start right after school as Correct. opposed to at three o'clock? Okay. Correct. And, and we're also accepting virtual only, learning only students in case oh. they want to participate in aftercare. Has that information gone out to parents? You know, I don't see oh, that. Oh yeah, because... yeah, we, okay. we've had a nice, yeah, we've had a nice uh, healthy <laughs> participation. Okay, that's fantastic, okay. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. Uh, additional structure, instructional periods. I believe this number 12, sorry. Thank you to our math teachers for um, covering some additional classes. I believe this is to cover a maternity leave. And of course we appreciate it. Um, 
Hold on a sec, my alarm is ringing, I'm sorry. Hey guys, can you turn my phone off? Please stop. I'm sorry, it's gonna be too complicated for me to do while reading the minutes. Please be quiet. Uh, so thanks to Ms. Ficklin, Finklin, Mr. Lee, Mr. Moore, Mr. Rectishall. Uh, number 13, change of program hours. 14, grade recovery teacher. 15, da, 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 da. okay, nothing else non self explanatory. Are there any questions? All right, Monique, was that your hand or was that just your hand moving in the video? Okay. No hand raised. Okay, all right, I'm all done, Mark. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, Darcy, would you like to go over the policies with us? I would love to. Um, although I just in listening to all the other committee chairs realized that I was completely remiss and I wrote up no minutes from our policy committee's April 13 uh, meeting. So I will go back and cobble some of those together and send those out. Um, although I have to admit there was nothing terribly scintillating in our meeting. Um, other than me explaining how I have been frantically trying to uh, dole out three policy alerts worth of policies to our committees so that we can get ourselves finally and hopefully once and for all caught up on policy. Um, so the policy committee did um, look over the policies that were for us, as you guys know, um, I've started divvying up the policies between our um, between our committees. So the ones that were for the policy committee, we did look over. So you'll see ten of those on the agenda tonight for first reading. Um, and then, as Ann mentioned, there was one. Somehow, Ann's committee got off pretty much scot free with only one policy that uh, they need to review. Um, and I'm grateful to Ann for having her committee review that one policy. And um, so we just have now the finance and um, curriculum and equity and excellence policies to go over. And what I would suggest to those committees, because it can be a total drag, particularly when there's like a whole hunk of them to go over and you don't want to suck up your entire committee meeting with policy, is um, one thing that we spend a fair amount of time discussing in the meeting was just kind of new procedures for kind of smoothing all these things out when new policies come up. And um, one thing that we will be sure to add to our process is that when um, Susan does that magic merge of our existing policy and the new Strauss SMA policy, that she spits that out to us as board committees as Google Docs. So if, say, finance doesn't want to suck up their entire finance meeting to review policy since there's only three of us we can just do it via google doc we can all each look at those docs we can put in our suggestions we can ask each other questions and we can just do them that way so i would suggest that to um curriculum and equity and excellence as well that you know if you guys don't want to have you know either take up your scheduled meeting or schedule a sec separate meeting just for policy um, I'm going to go through the Google Docs that Susan put together um, this week. I'll make sure those get distributed out to the committees and you guys think about maybe even just doing them that way. You know, just telling your committee members, please look at all these policies by X date. And then, you know, once everybody's comments are on there, we can, you can ship them back to policy and we'll take a look at those and get them onto an agenda. So that would be my suggestion because right now we are trying to bang out these last three policy alerts and uh, then we'll be officially caught up. And uh, I've talked to Scott about, um, you know, in the future having the our board at hpschools.net email address connected to Strauss Esme. So whatever they send out a policy alert, the entire board will get a notice. We'll all know that there's a new policy alert. We won't get snuck by policy, um, you know, two or three policy alerts backed up. Um, so we can hop on those as soon as possible because we do still have policies that we may want to tackle or you know, policies that are we're supposed to review yearly and we need to make sure we're getting to all that stuff. Um, and you can see on some of the ones that are here, even on this agenda, you know, I mean, there's stuff that we're, you know, we're pretty good and behind on, you know, um, in terms of like no child left behind stuff and testing stuff that's just not up to date. Um, so uh, you'll notice that uh, item three is also a bunch of policies that need to be abolished out of our, um, out of our policy uh, binder because they're just no longer um, they're no longer needed, like highly qualified teachers. I don't even know if that's not even a thing anymore, is it, Scott? I think that's just like kind of that's an old NCLB language that's just gone by the wayside. So um, there's also a handful of policies policies that are being abolished. So 
so that's about it. Um, if anybody has any specific, um, you know, questions or concerns on the policies that are on the agenda, um, if you go into the policy folder, you'll see that what's attached there is all the Google Docs. So you are more than welcome to put a comment there or a question or whatever. Tag me, tag Scott, and we'll um, we'll answer those questions. So I think the nice thing about doing it that way too is, you know, we don't always necessarily have to, uh, you know read 12 policies before a particular meeting you know you can kind of read them a little bit more piecemeal because it can be a lot i understand that so particularly when some of them are 33 pages long Ugh. darcy thank you so no yeah. questions about that okay um monique um equity and excellence i know um michelle gave the joint report but do you did you have anything to add uh not much thank you michelle for going through all the notes. I would just add that uh, in our discussion of the summer program, uh, we did talk quite, um, I think, substantively about uh, the how for high school students that the stakes you know, are, are, are quite higher in terms of the graduation requirements and using the summer program as a great recovery um, for those students. Uh, and we talked about you know, having honest conversations with those students about the fact that you know we don't want this to be about remediation, but in a sense we have these state regulations that they you know have to we have to comply with for them to be able to meet their graduation requirements. So um, Scott did talk about um, directing because uh, we wanted student voice to be a part of this program planning for the summer, and so he did talk. Scott did talk about directing the high school guidance team to meet um, with um, with the students and uh, who need to be encouraged you know to participate due to their graduation requirements. Um, and also just to, you know, present the situation and collect their input. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that we, you know, noted that. Um, and then additionally, uh, just in terms of the policies, yes, Darcy, you were, we were right thinking along the same lines as what you discussed or offered in terms of how to tackle these policies, because we did not unfortunately get to discuss them in the meeting, but we left the meeting, agreed to go back into the files over the next couple of weeks and just kind of like collaboratively um, note and edit and, and, and make our suggestions uh, you know, via the electronic docs. Um, so we will be on it. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And that is the right way to do it, you know, working offline. I started looking at the policies uh, before they were kind of merged and put into format. And you could you could as a committee work hours, so it's it's much better to do it offline. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any any questions or comments? Um, okay, so let's move on to our second public comment period. The Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation. Reserve this time for your comments, and I'm not going to read the policy numbers. Um, so if you have a comment or a question, just please raise your hand and. Uh, uh, Give your name and address and uh, we'll call on you. Okay, uh, seeing none, I'm gonna go on to the president's report, which I don't have one. Does anyone have old business? The board. Anybody on the board have new business? Uh, Chris. Uh, well, uh, could, we, we're, we're not doing a liaison reports tonight, but, but since we had a meeting at the uh, Commission for Universal Access last week and a question came up, uh, I just wonder if I could sure go ahead uh, ask a question about that now. Um, Dr. Till, you, you, you had, the, the, the thing we were discussing was, was very, uh, various pieces of, of uh, accessible uh, equipment like picnic tables and so on around town. Correct. Um, yeah, Do Dr. Taylor, you, you had mentioned that there was going to be some construction at the playground or area behind the high school. Uh, do you could, could you clarify a little bit more? You, you said it was something about w water issues back there uh, ca causing a construction project in that area. I don't think it was. I don't think I brought that up. Uh, okay. It doesn't sound familiar to me. Mark, do you recall us discussing uh, no. that in finance? No. Uh, Okay, so the, so the the only renovation that's being planned at the moment is the renovation of well, that that's being looked into is the track renovation. There's, and and we've discussed the Bartle back area as well. So those are the two sites outdoors that we would like to renovate. Uh, well, maybe maybe, maybe I'm, I got confused with the Bartle issue. 
uh, is who who is that being planned in in partnership with? Is it just the district, or is it also nobody yet? Because while yeah. we do have some money in savings, thanks to some fundraising efforts a few years ago by the PTO here, we don't have enough money lined up yet uh -huh. uh, to to have a, a viable project. So we haven't gone down the road of architecture and all that stuff. Uh -huh. the, the the one thing that came up at this uh, CUA meeting was. Uh, they, they've apparently had extensive uh, interaction with the rec department about what they feel is the proper uh, level of accessibility for the different equipment that's being bought. bought. I, I, I just wonder if we've already have a process in place to consult with them. Uh, no, but I can assure you that we yeah. will once we have a way forward. Um, okay. If we had the money lined up, we'd have to get the architecture uh, architects involved. And that would be the point at which we then meet with somebody from the commission. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, so um, if there's no new or old business, uh, um, I'm going to um, move to uh, adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? Mark. Yep. Just real quick. I yep. <laughs> tried to hit the reactions. I hit the thumbs up instead of the hand raise. I'm like, Go. oh, okay. I thought you were just <laughs> applauding that the meeting's over. <laughs> I tried to hit the right button and not do God. it. I just wanted to put one thing on the record because I read this tonight and I thought it was really interesting because I think, um, you know, obviously I know a lot of people have been very upset about the way this year has gone, you know, either in one direction or another, right? Schools didn't open up fast enough. Schools open too fast. There are kids are on the computer too many to hours. Kids aren't on the computers enough. You know, like it's just, it's kind of like a, a moving target, right? Um, and I, just, I read this I get a you know a daily newsletter from AJ Spotlight, um, which I found remarkably helpful throughout the pandemic because it talks about the state numbers and the national numbers and all of these things. And one of the things they had in their um, newsletter tonight was the school numbers in terms of how many schools are doing what. And I just want to read it because I think it's really helpful right. and impactful because, you know, people that we may talk to or people who come to our board meetings and comment may talk to may not have the perspective of what's really going on in the entire state. And I think that's kind of important to just mention. So I'm just gonna read this. So right now, currently there are 186 districts with 170,000 students that have full in-person schedules at their schools. So you'll notice, right? Some may sound like 186 districts, but that's 186 districts with not very many kids. There are 69 districts with 219,000 kids who are still all remote. So it's what, you know, sorry, you guys are better at math, Chris and Mark, but that's about a third of the kids, you know, right. like a third of the schools, but you know, you know, maybe another two thirds of the kids. And then there are 526 districts that, that are like us, um, that are serving nearly 900,000 students. So nearly a million of the kids in this, in this state are now in hybrid schedules. So while I understand that there are parents who think we should be all remote, and I understand that there are parents who think we should be in five days all day, we're we're right there in the middle, you know? And that's really the kind of district that we are, right? We're not a super affluent district. We're not a urban district. We're not, a, you know, like we're kind of, we're awesome, right? Like we're like a little bit of everything. And I think personally, I think we're right where we need to be. We have in-person instruction for the families and the kids who need it. And we have remote for the families and kids who need it. And, you know, I just, I guess I want to give like a shout out to Dr. Taylor, the administrators, the teachers for really just trying to do their best this year. Um, and I don't think a lot of people come to the board meetings and give a lot of praise or a lot of support or, you know, but it's been a remarkably hard year in so, so, so many ways. Um, never going to please everybody. Um, we're never all going to agree on anything, but, you know, and I do appreciate that a lot of the, the folks who have come to comment, you know, do, you know, even couch their criticisms with thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for how your hard you're working, you know, that we have that, you know, acknowledgement and respect for each other that, you know, even though we may not agree with each other's decisions all the time that we know that we're all doing our best for, um, for all of the kids because Ain't nobody getting through this without some stress and strife and upset. So that's it. Thank you, Darcy. Uh, I'm really glad you said that because it's been so incredibly difficult. And I mean, um, 
depending, you know, where you sit every day, um, every single day um, for families with children in the schools, uh, for our teachers, for, for our administrators, for board members, for families, it's really incredibly difficult. And, uh, and not to mention the mental stress of what we see every day in so many different news like reports. It, it's overwhelming to think about so all of the things that we're dealing with, right? A lot. Yep. All right. So any anyone else? Because I'm gonna move to adjourn. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna move to I'm moving to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Well, all in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. All right. See you all soon. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.